What a novelty I have for you today. This may well look like a soprano saxophone with a seatbelt attached to it, but it is in fact a new Hungarian invention called the Glissitar. Based broadly on the modern tarugato and the soprano saxophone, kind of a hybrid of the two instruments, this instrument takes things one step further by introducing the element of glissando into proceedings. So today I'm going to delve deeper into it, attempt to demonstrate this to you, and hopefully explain some of the applications for this wonderful new instrument. The first thing that strikes me about this instrument is that there are really interesting possibilities for musical activity and sound production. It's not just a case of playing the notes, which it can do very accurately when you learn how to play it, but the possibilities uh, that are on offer because of this glissando effect are kind of endless really. And it's not even just that, you can actually produce some really interesting sound effects, um, which we will get into later, I'm not going to reveal them right now. And in general, the sound that it produces is one of sheer quality as well. It's got a nice kind of woody character to it, a velvety richness. And so for me, it offers something really different tonally from many of the wind instruments that we have out there. Okay, let's talk about the design of this instrument now. So first of all, it has this conical bore, just like a saxophone or in fact a modern tarragotto. In terms of the material, I'll come back to that in a second, but the key feature that I want to point out to you is this very obvious glissando mechanism here. And so what we've got going on is this strap here this ribbon, if you like, is a magnetized ribbon which meets with two magnetized sections underneath which are surrounding this cutaway, a slot which runs the entire length of the instrument. And what happens is you put your fingers down at any point along this ribbon and you produce a pitch. And of course, if you're going to slide your finger, then naturally you would produce a glissando effect. So more on that later on, but that is the principal design characteristic behind this new instrument. And the, the belt itself is attached um, closely here at the top, and it's raised here at the foot by about an inch or so. And if we reverse the instrument, we can see these brass sections here. In the middle, we have a right hand thumb hook, which is actually adjustable, very neat. And we have a strap ring here. And at the top, we actually have not one, but two octave keys, which comes in very handy, as I'll explain later. At the top of the instrument, we actually have a standard brass neck and it actually uses a soprano saxophone mouthpiece. So for all of you sax players watching this video, and I'm sure that's the majority of you, it becomes very natural to play this instrument because we simply use our saxophone chops in order to get the, the first sounds on this instrument. It's just the business of learning how to use the fingering board, if you like. Now this instrument is actually available in two materials. What you're looking at here is actually a 3D printed material version of the Glissitar. But the original concept was always to have it produced in a amaranth material or purple heart as it's known, which is basically a Latin American tropical hardwood. Now, in terms of my experience on this instrument, I have to say at this stage, guys, you need to forgive me because I've only had across the weekend. Today, as of recording, this is Monday, so I've had Saturday and Sunday to get to grips with this instrument. I've had a whole load of fun, but I am, as you're about to hear, by no means an expert. So without further ado, let's hear my first attempts at playing on the glissitar. <laughs> So 
Well, as you can hear, it's quite a challenge if you're trying to play on this instrument well after just a few days. Um, so I'm now going to show you a clip of the inventor of this instrument, Daniel Vassi, who is not only a great sax player, but um, an incredible inventor. And he's the passion behind this instrument, has great expertise on the instrument. And now you can hear how it should be played. <laughs> So at first I found the whole process of learning this instrument a little bit daunting. I was presented by a few PDF sheets uh, by Daniel. And eventually, when I understood that the principle of starting out is not to try and play like a C major scale, as we might do on a recorder or a saxophone, but rather it's to understand that where our fingers naturally lie when we set our left hand in the position just below the octave key and our right thumb on the right thumb hook, our fingers fall into the position of playing chromatic notes. So normally if we think about a saxophone, we would have a B, A, G type thing and an F, E, D. Or well, in this case, broadly speaking, we're actually producing chromatic notes when we lay our fingers naturally on the instrument in this position. So we describe um, the, the style of playing a little bit like how you might do on a violin, that we have first position, second position, third position, fourth position. The stand posi uh, standard position, if you like, is um, I'm just calling it standard position. On the PDF sheet, it describes it as position zero, which is naturally where our fingers would find themselves. And it sounds, broadly speaking, like this. So what you actually heard there were the notes A, G sharp, G and F sharp, and then jumping down a minor third, D sharp, D, C sharp and C. So that is our first position. And then all we do, I'm not going to go into massive detail right now, but if you take that basic positioning and then you shift it up, you're shifting up by a semitone each time. Let's take a step backwards now and understand why the glissatar came about. So first of all, we have to pay credit to the Hungarian inventor Daniel Vassi, who was the main brains behind this operation, and he was assisted by Tobias Hereshi. And the two of them felt that in the wind instrument world, things haven't really innovated in many years. You could even say hundreds of years. If you think about the modern symphony orchestra, those instruments have been set since the 19th century. So their concept was to produce not just a single instrument, but an entire family of new instruments known as the glissonic family. And the glissatar is the first one in the, that series of instruments. So they're actually going to be available for clarinet, flute, saxophone, uh, tarragato, this is the tarragato version, um, and even cornet, I believe. Um, of course, with the main principle being that it has this continuous pitch. Now, there's a little bit of history of slide style or glissando style instruments in the past. I believe Leonardo da Vinci actually invented a flute way back when, which had a sliding mechanism. And of course, the, there were some early attempts to produce slide saxophones in the early 20th century but they were kind of flawed from the start, really. For a start, the sliding mechanism leaked, 
um, and you were only able to play to slide up and down to find your note. You weren't able to use the fingering system that we can, which is the main innovation, of course, of this instrument. So things have come on a whole load with this new glissatar design. Let's get back to the roots of this instrument. What makes it unique is the glissando element. And within this, of course, we can have so much fun. So I'm now going to demonstrate to you some of the weird and wonderful effects you can produce when we start sliding around on this thing. So what are the uses for the glissatar? I hear you shouting. Well, hopefully, as I've demonstrated, or as Daniel has demonstrated in this video, you can hear that it naturally has a very folky sound to it. And that, for me, feels like the main application uh, for the glissatar. But then you can stretch that out into all sorts of contemporary styles of music and jazz, maybe even rock. Who knows where it might be in five or ten years' time. Basically, it is a very versatile instrument. It has a challenging system, which is completely new, of course, to all of us right now at the time of making of this video. But challenges are what makes life exciting, right? Now, just a couple of little criticisms um, that I have experienced along the way over the weekend. I found myself, well, my left hand thumb just getting pinched as I move between the first and the second octave, trying to attain those higher notes. It might be just a case of trying to adjust my positioning and perhaps even leaping from the first octave to the second in order to smoothly transition. I do know that the makers spent years getting to, to the point where we have this instrument now. In fact, I think they had something like 185 prototypes come in and out and straight out the back door before they arrived at this final instrument. So I'm sure they have done a great job there to, to get to this point. But also, I should let you know that these instruments are not cheap. Uh, this one, the Glissatar Jam, made from the 3D material, um, at the time of this video is a little under 2,000 euros. And you can add on another 1,000 euros or so for the Purple Heart model. So it's expensive stuff. But you could also look at it along the lines of that this is a premium level instrument. They're not mucking around these guys. They want to produce an instrument that is going to turn heads and, you know, perhaps have its own legacy. So in that sense, for those of you who are serious instrument, uh, maybe collectors or interested in the latest designs out there and something that is completely new and hasn't been done in ages, as I've said, we've not had innovation in the wind instrument circles for many, many years. I'm sure that this will pique your interest. These instruments are now available to purchase on our website. We have a demonstration model permanently available in our London store. That's it from me for the time being. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please do remember to like, share and subscribe and I'll see you guys on the next video.